Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Hello. We have a special guest today, John Mariani, a noted author, the virtual gourmet uh, newsletter author. Uh, you can find him, by the way, at johnmariani.com if you want to read the blogs. But if you want to know about wine or food almost any place in the world, this is the guy. Hi, John. Well, speaking, John, good to see you. But speaking well, of wine or food anywhere else in the world, I have an interesting question for you. St. Patrick's Day, my favorite holiday, um, was a few weeks back. And I noticed as I was driving down the street on St. Patty's Day, that passed some of my favorite Italian restaurants. Those yeah. are your people, John. I even passed a good Jewish deli, your people art. Nothing like a good knish, that's what I'd say. Uh, if it's not a latka, it's got to be a knish. I passed by a Thai restaurant. Um, and, and the point is that there is no Irish cuisine restaurants. I've never seen a restaurant that has opened for more than a day that serves corned beef and cabbage is a big deal. Mm -hmm. What is it about the Irish that they didn't bring a cuisine, their own native cuisine to America? Uh, there are a couple of different answers. First of all, all the ethnic cuisines that you just mentioned, uh, including Italian, Thai, uh, German, anything else, uh, Jewish, certainly, these people were not running restaurants back in the old country because they were very, very poor people. I mean, my ancestors from uh, Italy uh, did not say, hey, let's go out for, uh, to the local trattoria even to get a pizza, because they didn't have any money to do so or to open restaurants. It was only here that America in the land of opportunity um, gave all of these people very easy access, Chinese, the Thais, everybody from Asia. First thing you can get into with ease and very little money is the food business. Grocery, set up a Thai grocery, set up a, uh, a, a Chinese restaurant, okay? So each of the ethnic groups, all of them, did just that. Czechs and, and Germans and Russians and so forth. It was easy access, and they formed these things which are called the Italian-American restaurant, started out as pizzerias, and the Chinese-American restaurant, which was serving dishes that Chinese didn't know, like chow mein and egg foo young and so forth. Japanese restaurants, which had never heard of neg negamaki and uh, some of the, the beef dishes that, uh, that are, are uh, here. So uh, with the Irish-American, it is true that they did not have a uh, highly developed cuisine um, or even uh, food traditions because it was a very impoverished country. Some would say the English kept it that way, which uh, is arguable. Um, but they did not have, they were very, very poor people who lived off the land. So even in Dublin or Belfast 100 years ago, 150 years ago, people were not dropping into going out for Irish food. Um, if they went to a restaurant, and restaurants existed by that time in the mid-19th century and in Belfast and Dublin, it was only that wealthy people were going to them. And then they were eating generally the French or continental cuisine. They would be eating what uh, would be eaten in an English manor house or an Irish manor house because the Irish had their own aristocracy. So the poor people were living off the land. And herein comes the story of the potato, the tater, the tatty. Uh, yes. The English introduced the potato, the white American potato. Uh, not the not, not the, the sweet potato, which comes from South America, but the white American uh, tomato um, to Ireland because they did find that it grew en enormously well and proliferated very, very well uh, so that you could feed both animals and human beings on it at very little cost. And uh, it wasn't that they're trying to save money. It was that they, hey, you know, plant this stuff and these people are going to be able to eat. They could also feed it to their hogs and everything else. Uh, Jonathan Swift was Irish. Um, he was an archbishop in, in, in Dublin itself. Once said that what the potatoes are good for is it's pigs and Irishmen. And he was being sarcastic. What happened, though, in the earlier part of the 19th century, when the potato came in, is that it was enormously successful. What this is about all the Irish 
poor had to eat. That's about it. And you have to eat a lot of potatoes. They're full of vitamins, but you got to eat a lot of them to get to extract all of that, all of those vitamins and goodies and nutrients. Okay, it's not like, and, and there's not much protein in it. They're carbohydrates, so they they can get you to work in the morning um, after you had a bowl of porridge. Um, and it was, it was either eating potatoes or eating porridge all day long. And the in the uh, movie uh, My Left Foot, uh, the poet Christy Matthews, I think his name was, is a scene um, in which he, he or his brother says to his, his father, with like nine, ten kids, and uh, he says, I don't want none of this bloody pa- porridge anymore. And he just gets whacked. And he says, "You, the father says, you'll eat it and you'll like it, or you don't have to like it because that's all you have to eat. Monday, Monday through Friday, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. So a nice potato would be like having a sirloin steak if all you're eating is porridge. However, in 1844, 1845, the uh, potato crop failed in Ireland. And what that did, since this was all that they had to eat, it, the, the crops just withered. They just rotted completely. There was no, next to nothing left. That millions of Irish were starving to death. Millions. Uh, literally starved to death. And the British tried to do what they could. Um, the, the British were always the bugbear to the Irish, but uh, they were trying to do what they could to keep the uh, Irish alive. Um, they couldn't do very, very much. So either an Irishman and his family died, or like one million of them, imagine that, one million people after 1845, immediately after, emigrated to the United States, uh, where they were able to eat uh, quite well. Um, I mean, so t- that today there are more Irish in New York, uh, all of whom go on parade on, on uh, March 17th, um, than there are in Dublin, even to this day. More Irish in New York than in Dublin um, to this day. Uh, <clears throat> and, why, and it's also why the Irish, of course, gained enormous political power by the end of the 19th century. So um, the Irish get here, and what they did have back on, in the old sod were pubs. And pubs were places where you got a minimal amount of food in the English tradition. You'd have bangers and mash, and you'd have uh, um, a, a, a steak and kidney pie, and, and a lot of potatoes, uh, a lot of potatoes on, on shepherd's pie, and uh, and so forth. That that was about all they had. If you watch the, uh, the uh, any of the Irish movies, including The uh, Quiet Man, uh, you'll see that this is what everybody's eating. So they didn't have formal restaurants with white tablecloths. Um, so in America, the Irish, in every neighborhood they settled into in the big cities, not least New York and Boston, they opened pubs um, because they were eating back at home and they were eating much better back at home. Um, the whole uh, thing about celebrating with corned beef and cabbage is really an American uh, Irish or Irish American idea. Um, because beef was much, much cheaper here than they could ever have had on their tables back in Ireland. And if you corned it, you're basically preserving it, and you can, you can keep it for even even more time. And cabbage, of course, is the cheapest thing you can possibly have. I was watching a movie the other day uh, uh, with uh, Claude Rains, in which he goes into a, a, a theatrical boarding house. He's going up the stairs, and he's a producer, and he says, why do these boarding houses always smell like cauliflower and cabbage? Um, because that's, that's pretty much what they ate every single night at a boarding house. And they'd have a big plate of potatoes and have the cabbage and they'd have some corned beef or, or, or something along those lines, uh, maybe a stew. So that's where the corned beef and cabbage comes from, the whole idea. Now, the other Irish traditions that they would kept of cor- keep, of course, was to drink Guinness and to drink Irish whiskey. And that most Irish of all concoctions, Irish coffee, which... It isn't, really. I mean, everybody in (laughs) Ireland does drink Irish coffee now. Irish coffee started out as a uh, marketing gimmick at uh, the old uh, airport, the old um, seaplane airport um, uh, outside of Dublin, where the seaplanes used to come in. And this guy was trying to sell Irish whiskey to the uh, tourists, basically. And um, uh, he made up Irish coffee and brought the idea 
to um, was picked up uh, by a, a visitor a guy named Sam Delaplane, who brought it back to his bar at the Lake Buena Vista Bar in San Francisco. And he combined it with this creamy cream and with sugar and started to make Irish coffee, which by now they sold literally a billion of. And that and there's a plaque on the wall or outside of the Lake Buena Vista, uh, not Lake Buena, Buena, but the Buena Vista Cafe in San Francisco at Fisherman's Wharf there, um, Pierdelli Square, that says this is where Irish coffee was born. And that's, in fact, uh, very true. Um, so much that there was this, um, there was this movie a few years ago with Brad Pitt, he was, uh, comes to America as an Irish revolutionary and kind of be, being hidden. I think it was the Patriot game or something. And he's being hi hidden by an Irish-American family. And they said, well, serve him. We'll serve him corned beef and cabbage. And you know, he's going to love that. And they put it on the table. He takes one look at it and says, oh, this looks terrific. I've never had this before. So Irish-American food, like all those other slash American foods, um, or adaptions, so that in Italian food, there are many, many Italian dishes they just do not have in Italy, and there are many uh, Chinese dishes they do not have in China. So, too, um, the Irish have maintained an Irish-American cuisine, uh, and, and to celebrate uh, mostly on uh, St. Patrick's Day, which, incidentally, is not that big a holiday over there. In Ireland, it's more of a, a, a religious holiday, a saint's day, rather than an excuse to uh, get hammered and everything, which is why I asked an Irish poet friend of mine who um, I went to college with, Terry Winch, and he's a well-known poet. Um, and I said, because uh, we always used to celebrate uh, St. Patrick's Day here with the with the booze and everything else, that uh, why do all of the most famous, best-known Irish acts, like um, the, uh, the, um, uh, the, the Dubliners and uh, the Chieftains, and uh, others, why do they uh, appear in, in New York on St. Patrick's Day? Uh, is it just a question of more money? And he says, no, he says, because they don't really make a big deal of it over in Ireland, so they can play there anytime they want. But everybody wants to hear the Clancy Brothers and the Dubliners and, and that's so forth, the Coors um, here. So they do very well by coming to America and playing here. Isn't that interesting? It is interesting. And it makes me proud of my Irish heritage that when my ancestors came, besides digging canals, which is what my people did, they opened up pubs. Mm -hmm. like, John Pye, there's nothing better than a good pub. I think mm -hmm. that's a fine thing to do. It's not as nice as bolognese or a good knish or a good pad thai, but I love those pubs, I do. And that happy St. Patrick's Day. A little, a little belated, St. Patrick's you know, I, Day. I just thought. Um, um, oh, you still here, Art? Uh, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm listening. I actually, as a, a, a early twenties college student in New York City, I would only eat at Irish pubs. I mean, you could afford it. It was great. In those days, you could get a beer. I was old enough to get a beer, and um, it was just a great place to sit and chat and so on and so forth. Uh, and that was the staple to uh, without. Irish pubs. I don't know that I would have made it through college, uh, because the I would Blarney have, Stone, yeah, steam people. Art the Blarney Stone. They they had a Blarney Stone in Manhattan. McSor every four blocks. McSorley's. I mean, there was. Yes. It, but it, in any event, I was just thinking, how's this? An Irishman, a Jew, an Italian walked into a pub. Now, mm -hmm. if the three of us did the pubs of of the places that don't normally have pubs, so we look for places like Southern California, uh, uh, San Diego. They don't have many. Yes. Let's go find the pubs, yeah. the pubs of the world. You're right. Yeah. Well, do you know what this good Italian-American boy, that would be me. Oh, yeah. For this, this year's uh, St. Patrick's Day. Wow. I drove down to Riverdale in the Bronx mm -hmm. to a Jewish delicatessen because <laughs> I knew they were going to have great corned beef I bought a pound of corned beef. I bought a pound of um, of pastrami, and my wife wanted some pickled herring because she's a Russian heritage. And I brought that home, and then went to the grocery, and I got some Guinness, and I got some Irish whiskey, 
which I'm going to have for afterwards. And my wife is going to be make, making cold cannon, which is mashed potatoes with uh, cabbage in it. And we're going to have the corned beef, and we're going to have the pastrami. And then we're finishing off with an Italian cheesecake. So you got to come to my house, Artie. Yeah, no, it, it, <laughs> the, you are the gourmet. You, yeah, the, in every I'm sense of the me. word. Yeah, I'll be there. What time? If I get on uh, a plane now? Walter Bagley will be there. <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much, John. It's great to uh, not only have the explanation of uh, corned beef and cabbage and Irish cuisine, but the history behind it, too. I really appreciate that. My pleasure. And uh, I'm going to go have a Guinness right now. Me, too. <laughs> Can you show anybody? Cool, temperature. cool, not cold. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.